So, good morning. Um, I'm Matthias Vraas. I'm an independent consultant from Belgium. Uh, I mostly advise uh, teams and companies on uh, dealing with uh, or building software for complex environments, uh, legacy, quality assurance, these kind of things. Currently, mostly in um, domains like energy trading, etc. Uh, and not a lot of PHP lately, but uh, some of my clients uh, are still PHP, so I still enjoy doing it. Um, so, this is me. This is not a programming talk. I say this up front because sometimes people get a little bit disappointed that I'm not showing any code. Um, there are some other talks uh, about event sourcing um, and, and other related ideas, I think, so uh, you might find some related information there. Um, so maybe I'd, I'd like to ask, uh, who in this room models uh, anything? It like could be making drawings or diagrams or raise your hand. Please. Okay, that's a lot of people. Um, so for those who don't, there's a little secret. Actually, you are always uh, making models. When somebody describes a problem to you, you are making a model of this in your head. But this is hidden. This is invisible to everybody else. When you have a meeting with somebody, when you are discussing somebody, something, you are actually trying to synchronize mental models, but this is very hard because one person is talking and the other one is maybe not even listening, but trying to think about what they're going to say next, and it's very messy. You don't know what the other one is thinking. So this is why we need visualizations uh, for models. And we, we, we're not good enough at this yet. Um, we have been experimenting in the past with things like UML, etc. but I'm going to try to illustrate why it's sort of too limited. Um, so what are models? Models are, well, uh, you saw the slides, uh, diagrams, uh, drawings, post-its, whatever. Uh, could be documentation, anything really that sort of represents uh, this concept you're trying to model. But we're not trying to make this accurate. We're not trying to model the real world because, you know, what is the real world anyway? Um, we're trying to find abstractions that are practical, that are useful, you know, that help us to solve problems. Uh, George Box once said, uh, all models are wrong, but some are useful. This should be our main evaluation. It's not trying to, you know, people sometimes ask me, am I modeling this correctly? I don't know. Is this useful? Is this working? Try it. Build something. Evolve it. Um, model it some more, etc. cetera. Um, so this talk, this talk is about uh, what Gerald Weinberg calls the, the grant economy. Uh, in a book he wrote on uh, systems analysis, he wrote a couple of, he's actually, if you never heard of Gerald Weinberg, he was um, a programmer at IBM, uh, not before your father was born, but probably before your grandfather was born. He's that old. He's still, he's like 90 now. He's still writing books. Uh, he wrote 50 books uh, on software development and testing and uh, even the psychology of, of programming. And, um, and so he says that any system, any uh, man-made system or any natural system, so he's not even just talking about programs, um, can be considered as two, two parts, things and processes, uh, state and state changes, you know, um, uh, you, you, or maybe artifacts and behaviors. And a lot of what we have been doing is actually focusing on the things and not on the processes. The processes are there. I mean, your software runs over time. It behaves over time. It has events happening over time. It has behavior over time. Uh, but what we're modeling is this sort of very static drawings. And we'll get back to that in a moment. Uh, so this talk, I'm, I'm going to try to convince you to do a lot more um, what we could call temporal modeling. Trying to make a model that shows how the system behaves over time instead of what are the, the artifacts in this system. And um, so Weinberg goes on and, and describes that there's uh, three kinds of processes. Processes, uh, he calls them being, behaving, and becoming. Uh, you might have heard these kind of things in, in different names. So being is how the system maintains its own state. It's how it, it remains what it is, uh, how it's structured, its, its morphology. Um, Weinberg calls it the, the constant structure over time. Um, and a lot of systems have this sort of behavior that is just maintaining what they are. Uh, behaving is, of course, uh, how it reacts to inputs. You know, you're trying to do something with the system, it behaves in a certain way, it reacts, it responds to you. Um, and very often this kind of behavior is, is uh, repeatable, reversible, so it's things that you keep doing. Uh, we're using the system and we keep doing the same things uh, with this system. And then becoming is sort of the, 
uh, transitions into something else. There are points in this system where it becomes something else and it's now something else entirely, or the structures in the system become something else. Uh, we could call this the evolution of the system or how the system learns, how the system uh, evolves, its development, its history. Right? Um, and so these three, these three aspects, it's, it's somewhat, well, you could call it philosophical, it's thinking about systems, uh, all systems in general, which is why it's called general systems thinking, of course. But this applies to the systems we're building, and I think it's good to sometimes you know, take a step back and think about what we're doing uh, instead of just, just coding all the time, because the systems we build, they affect people. They have, uh, depending on what we're building, but most of them, you know, they, they, they enter people's lives and change how they do stuff. So it's good to know what we're doing. So this is sort of a very, um, well, it's not a proper UML diagram. It's more sort of a, well, it's almost a parody, uh, which was not my intention. But um, this is what we're doing. We're making structural models. We're, we're making a representation of all the things, all the artifacts in the system. Um, and, and not only is this sort of an incomplete representation, because it doesn't show us how the system uh, maintains its structure, being it doesn't show us how it behaves, um, so the behaving, the, the second B, and it doesn't show us how it changes over time. Uh, and, and this kind of modeling uh, is also scary to non-technical people, to business people. So this actually hurts communication. If you, if you start doing UML diagrams, um, you, you're scaring them away. Where, in fact, the point of modeling should be communication, should be learning about this domain. We should understand the system that we're building, uh, that we're building software for. Um, so this is, this is sort of the central idea in, in a lot of things that I have been doing over the years and, and, and working on and talking about and reading about is that um, it's not, it's not what the customer wants that gets built. It's not what the domain expert thinks uh, about the domain or what the business analyst thinks uh, it should be or the product owner. In the end, it's what the developer understands of the system. This understanding is what gets built into the system. That's why everybody should be an analyst and, sh and everybody should be focused on finding better ways of communicating with these domain experts. So I have an example. It's something from uh, sort of simplified uh, or, or uh, behavior-driven development, BDD. Uh, I think uh, Matthias mentioned it a little bit in his talk. Uh, who's familiar with BDD? Okay, good. So it's, um, it's a way of testing where you describe scenarios, examples of scenarios. Um, there's tools that can help you, like uh, Behat in, in PHP. Um, and so what we do is we describe this, this scenario. So this could be a scenario as a shopper in order to uh, buy stuff, given I have a product X with a price, 100 euros. Uh, when I do this, then this should happen, et cetera. So you describe these tests and then you use them to build the system, uh, or you describe the scenarios rather. Now, um, while you're reading this, I said before that you're always mental modeling. It's a very, it's an extremely simple example, just to, you know, because we, we don't have a lot of time. But when you're reading this, I bet that a lot of you actually have a structural model in your head right now. You probably have some kind of object that represents a product, or maybe a table that represents products. Um, and it probably has some field, some property uh, with the price in it, right? So this would possibly be a good model for this. I don't know. It we, we, evaluate models based on their usefulness. But the, the way this story is written affects your mental model. If this was the first story you had seen, you'd probably have a different mental model. So this one says, as a shop owner, instead of a shopper, in order to sell stuff, uh, given I have product X, and that product is priced 100 euro in the pricing table, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, if this was the first story you had seen, then this might have given you a different mental model where maybe prices are not attached to products at all. Now, what this is actually saying, a pricing table is just a, a document that a shop owner uses to make decisions about prices. So in the physical world, it would be somebody with a paper document. Uh, instead of having to walk through the store and look at all the prices and change some prices strategically, et cetera, they can just look at the document and, and, and work with this. And the same idea we could have this in an, in an e-commerce system. Um, but if this was the first story you saw and the first 
feature you were building, then probably you would have come up with a different structural model where uh, you have products and where you have a pricing table, um, just because of, of the language. So what I really think is that a lot of BDD that we're doing and a lot of this, the example scenarios that people tend to write using BDD um, are actually pseudo-behavioral. They're not describing behavior or they're only doing it partly, but they're describing structures. They're imposing a structural model onto the reader, onto the developers. Right? Because of it was saying um, uh, as a shopper uh, in order to buy stuff that there is a product with a price. That's a structure. That's a thing. right? And I'm trying to get you to think about processes. So a different way of describing this with nothing but behavior would be this. As a shopper in order to buy stuff, given the shop owner has priced the product at 100 euros. Has priced. This is behavior. So here we're not descri describing the state. We're not describing the structure. We're not saying there's a product or there's a pricing table or whatever. We're just describing things that somebody has done. Events that have happened in the past. And of course, if you know these events, then you can derive what the price of the product is. Again, a very simple example, but here it's very easy from, from the story. Uh, it, it's a proper story here. It's, 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 it tells things that have happened over time. And this kind of telling stories, this style of telling stories, um, in my experience and that of others, is much more powerful because it decouples you from the structures. I have complete freedom now, both in practice and in my mind, as to what kind of structures I will use to model this problem. Because I describe the problem from events as a real story, as real behavior, instead of sort of pseudo behavior where I'm describing state. Um, so what does this mean in practice? I had, I had a client a while back and uh, they have some online education system. And uh, the way this one of these developers in the team was describing the domain to me was in this very structural language. As you can see here, teachers have multiple courses, each with multiple models. Students have multiple. Things have things. It's blocks with relations between them, you know, boxes and arrows, entities and entity relationships. Um, now, this, this again, is this a useful model? Is this a practical model? Well, it is to some degree. I can make some objects of this. I can make some relations. I can make some, some schemas for this with some foreign keys, etc., and, and map out this whole structure. But it doesn't, uh, it doesn't tell us how this system behaves. And because we're not really thinking about the behavior, we're missing important things, maybe. We don't even know what they are because we, haven't even, we don't even have the sort of visual language to talk about them. Um, the sort of questions that interest me when I'm trying to model a problem, when I'm trying to learn a new domain, learn to understand the business that I'm building a, 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 a software for, these are the kind of questions that I want to know. Not just what are the things and how do they relate, but what changes? How does it change? How often does it change? Under what circumstances? Who's doing this change? And, and most importantly, what are the consequences of these changes? Because that's the thing that becomes really invisible if you have these boxes and, and arrows. Um, so for example, we have, uh, if we think back to the three Bs, becoming. Um, so imagine people, teachers are making some modules, making a course, and then some student comes and is taking some of the modules. Uh, it, uh, they, they register for a course, they actually pay for this, and then they have to take some of the modules, uh, do some exam, and they get grades for that. But now what happens is that something we never thought about, we just have this sort of CRUD system where you can add things and remove things and update things, uh, modules and, and courses, etc. And um, the behavior is that people, teachers are, sometimes they change their mind or they have new ideas, they remove a module, they add a module. And we can ask the questions now, what changes, what are the consequences of the change? So in this case, the problem that they had, they discovered this like one year into production that uh, sometimes uh, grades would just disappear. Uh, what happened, of course, was that teachers were removing modules um, and uh, not thinking about the consequences of that. And the system d was undefined, really. It had no, they hadn't modeled this scenario. So uh, students who already completed some of the modules, they would lose their grades or it would just disappear. And, uh, uh, of course, what should have happened is either it should have been impossible to remove them or they should be able to transfer the grades 
uh, or you should be able to stay in version one of the course while new students are already in version two, this kind of thing. That's, that's behavior over time. That's something they could have prevented this with temporal modeling. So um, I'm going to briefly mention event sourcing because that's sort of the practical way of implementing uh, temporal models in, in, in practice. Uh, I think there's a talk about it. So the, the basic, who has heard of event sourcing actually? Who has applied it in practice? A few people, okay. So um, if there's time, I will have some fun ideas at the end for the guys who have experience with event sourcing. So, but the very basic idea is that um, you can describe a thing with state, but if you know the history of this thing, if you know all the state changes that happened to this thing, all the events that happened over time, uh, then you can actually project state from that. That's the basic idea, that an artifact, uh, instead of just storing the state, we can store the entire history. And if you know the history, then you can uh, determine the state from that. The same way your uh, bank account works. You don't see um, balance uh, zero, but you see uh, accredited some money, debited some money, maybe got some interests. Um, these are all events that happened to your bank account. Same way with uh, 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 accounting for, you know, if you have an accountant, they also do this. They keep every, every change. They don't change events. So it's a immutable. It's an immutable history of everything that has happened. If they make a mistake, instead of changing events, they actually add a new event that corrects the, the mistake. So it's a new line. You're not allowed to remove lines in an, in an account ledger. So this idea is not new, but Nowadays, uh, be, it, it used to be um, too cost prohibitive in terms of storage, etc. But today, it's actually very uh, easy to build these kinds of systems. And people have been doing this. Uh, I have been doing this for four, three or four years, I think. Um, so, well, this is what I'm saying. If you have the history, you can determine the state. That's the basic idea. There's more to event sourcing than just this. But I wanted to, to frame this in, uh, in this concept. So. I have been talking before that we need better visualizations and we need better ways of collaborating between domain experts and, and uh, developers, uh, product owners. And this is a technique called event storming, um, which was invented by a friend of mine. And um, we have been doing this, oh, uh, we and other people, um, at, at different places, at different companies, and it works really well. What happens is that you look for you, you get in a room with domain experts, you make sure you have big walls and big sheets of paper, and you try to visualize what happens in this domain by writing down events on post-its. So it could be as simple as um, invoice was paid. Uh, I have some examples later on. Um, any Anything that happens, uh, account was credited. Uh, I actually describe them as little sentences. So my events, they become they start as post-its on a wall, they are events over time, and they end up as uh, events in my system uh, that I use to build up my entire model, basically. Uh, so the, the starting point is the events. Uh, they are things that have happened in the past, things that are of interest to the business. Um, it's very easy because you can start playing around with time, uh, and, and it's very uh, easy for, for non-technical people as well. It's just post-its. It's just writing natural language, natural sentences on, on post-its. Um, so I'm, I'm going to try to illustrate how it works. Um, so normally you would use post-its uh, and you would write it on the post-it. Here I have a little bit of a different notation because I needed to fit it on the screen. And of course the examples are uh, again very simple. Um, but as you can see from the picture, you can easily fill entire walls with, uh, with this kind of thing. Um, and I, uh, I should mention that I, I modeled it as a, as a little envelope because they are messages. If you, was, if you were in uh, Matthias Nobach's talk before, he was talking about this as well, events, commands, um, uh, queries. These are messages. So this is sort of a message-centric uh, architecture or, or model even. So the first event, we look for something that is interesting to the business, right? Invoice was paid. Hey, business, are you interested in invoices being paid? Yes, awesome. So we put that on post-it, put it on the wall. And the next question is, uh, so it's a timeline. So the next question is, uh, what happened before? What caused this event to happen? This is, this is Newtonian. It's cause and effect, right? So uh, we pick a different color for that, uh, blue here. 
um, and we write down the imperative, the action that somebody wants to do, the intention that somebody has. Uh, somebody, the customer here probably, wants to pay for an invoice, so they tell the system, you know, pay for invoice. These messages uh, typically would have some attributes in them with, I don't know, like invoice ID and uh, amounts, etc. So basically we have a very simple behavioral temporal model that somebody tells the system, you know, pay for this invoice, I want to pay for this invoice, and the system reacts by announcing, you know, this invoice was paid, the event has happened. So it's, it's, it's time, it's cause and effect. Now, the next question that we can ask, um, so typically with event storming, you would look for a lot of events first and then start looking for commands, etc. Here I'm sort of compressing it uh, in, in how you would do it. So the next thing we can ask is actually this command, will this always succeed? Could there be some kind of business rule in between that determines the outcome of this command? There might be lots of things. There might be uh, things that maybe um, maybe when you when you click a button, uh, you don't. It doesn't have the effect that you want because maybe the system says, "Oh no, somebody beat you to it," or uh, maybe you're not allowed to do it, or something has changed in the system. Maybe your account is depleted. Any kind of business rules. Uh, typically, we don't trust the client. Of course, we don't trust the user to know all the state of the system and all the rules of the system. So that's why we have something in between. This is, our, this is the point of our domain model, enforcing these business rules and constraints and invariants. So the way we can look at this, why, why could this fail? Any idea? Why could pay for invoice, this command that I sent to the system, why could it fail? I'm sorry? I, I can't hear you with the noise uh, outside. but. Um, I'll just answer it myself. Uh, it could be that uh, I'm trying to pay with uh, the amount which is too small. Um, of course, we could just throw an exception or raise an error or something. Um, but we're here in the room with the domain expert, so we can ask, you know, uh, if somebody tries to pay an invoice and they pay with an amount that is too low, uh, do we refuse the payment? They would probably say no. We keep at least that money. Then we, ha we are sure we have, you know, half the money or, or whatever the amount is. Um, and so on this, this business rule, uh, again, I wrote it uh, at the bottom, but typically I would write it on the post-it. Uh, the business rule is basically that if the paid amount is less than the invoice amount, we emit an event saying invoice was partially paid. Uh, if the amount is equal, then we emit an event saying invoice was paid. Right. Um, by reading this, if you have you know, the slightest inch of mathematical brain, you see that this is incomplete. There is actually a third possibility. Um, so it is technically possible that somebody pays us too much, right? Um, and again, we can ask uh, the domain expert, you know, what happens when somebody pays too much? Uh, well, if they're dishonest. Um, but typically it would be something like, okay, we uh, reimburse the money or we um, uh, book it to the next invoice. If they have like a recurring billing, then they would subtract uh, this overpaid amount from the, uh, from the, from the next invoice. But um, again, simple example, but what I find is that if you start writing down your business rules explicitly as mathematical formulas were possible or just as as text or some way of describing the business rule um, and showing this is this is branching really this is you could in code this would look like an, an if statement or a, or a switch uh, with three cases um, but by writing this down and by talking about this with domain experts you can actually see the things that you're missing that typically would maybe only discover uh, days or weeks or or even months or years later in the into the project um, this one is something you would probably have discovered when you're programming it because it's so simple. But for more complex cases, this actually works really well to write down your, your business rules. Um, and so we have this, this structure now, this branch. Uh, somebody tries to do something and some business rule determines what the actual outcome is. Um, and we can, some, some other notation that I, I like to use is to sort of show where a process ends, right? So this is a process. At the end, when the invoice is paid, we we are done. We don't, we, you know, we, we have the money. Everybody's happy. 
the process. And so I mark this with a little bit with a little symbol just so I can see what's what's going on there. But the next question we can uh, we can ask is this business rule. Um, this business rule needs some knowledge about things that have happened before, about things that happened before the business rule. This makes a lot of sense. Business rules make decisions based on history, right? And based on what you're trying to do. So we can just draw this with, with arrows. We could say that um, the, the, the business rule to decide which of the three branches we're going in needs to know the paid amount. And this amount in this very simple model would be in this command. Well, in real life, probably it would be more like um, we would monitor some bank account or we would have some credit cards or whatever. So you wouldn't even, with credit cards, you, you wouldn't even be able to pay the wrong amount. So it's a simple example, just keep that in mind. But so here in this, in this model, when somebody fills in a form and sends a command to the system, the business rule needs to know the, the payment amount, but it also needs to know the amount of the invoice we could put that in the in the command itself, but that's that command is untrusted. Remember, because the the client sent it. If if all the information, if both the paid amount and the invoice amount were in the command, uh, then the the user could simply spoof this and write, uh, you know, it's only one euro, and then pay one euro, and it would look to our system as if uh, the invoice was paid. So something has happened before. Uh, maybe the invoice was created, or maybe if we try to use even better sort of natural language, because this is sort of crud, but uh, we could have written, um, customer was invoiced. This is how uh, accountants would, would talk. They wouldn't say created, they would say, so I, I should fix the slide. Uh, but it's, uh, customer was invoiced, and that event, again, has some metadata about what happens there. Uh, so the, the invoice amount would be in there. So now these two arrows show that this business rule needs these two bits of information to, uh, to make a decision. And then again, we can ask what happens before, and maybe there's a command that kicks off the whole thing, uh, invoice customer or create invoice. That could be the start of a process. It could be longer as well if multiple people need to build up uh, this invoice over time. But again, simple model. And then we can also start asking, we have, we have two in incompleted uh, processes there. Um, so I'm not going to go into detail with the invoice that was overpaid, but we can start thinking about what happens when an invoice is underpaid, when it's partially paid. Well, some new command needs to be sent, uh, hopefully. So the customer will probably pay some more. So this is again, the, the, uh, this command would again be pay for invoice and we have the same business rule and we have again three possible outcomes where either the amount is fully paid or it's partially paid or it's overpaid. The reason I'm not just, when I'm modeling this, the reason I'm not just um, you know, writing loop or something or putting an arrow back to the beginning of the process is because sometimes processes are actually, if, if you loop them, affected by something happening uh, before. For example, here, um, our business rule is actually a little bit more complex than it was before because it's not just the paid amount and the invoice amount, it's the, it's the sum of all paid amounts that we need to consider. So this business rule doesn't just need knowledge about the command and event, but also about the starting event here, where the invoice was first created. Um, uh, sorry, the, the paid, uh, yeah, I mean this one. So this one and this one, that's what I'm saying. So um, I, I hope this makes sense. So we're, we're basically by visualizing even repetition so we're not trying to be dry here, we're, we're allowing repetition here, we're visualizing it, and we might even discover more about our processes than we would in, uh, if, if we didn't do all of this. Again, uh, this, the example is so simple that it almost seems silly to do it, but with complex scenarios, this really, really works well. Um, there's actually some more, there might be actually two events coming out of this same business rule. Um, we could, uh, for example, if we want to um, broadcast these events to other parts of the system to event listeners or even external systems that are listening to our events uh, using an event bus. Um, they could have, uh, we could have two events to make it very explicit. So we have, here we, we had invoice was partially paid, invoice was partially paid. You could listen to both of these and then keep and to the uh, customer was invoiced event and then keep track of all the state and then you would know that the invoice was paid or we could just make it easy for the clients, for the event listeners, and emit another event saying, you know, the invoice is fully paid now. 
So they can clients could choose if they are if if the event listener is interested only in the fact that an invoice is paid and not in the intermediate steps, it would only listen to this uh, last event. If a client is interested in you know how fast do our customers pay, for example, we could listen to uh, to more granular events of every partial payment. So what I'm saying is now we have. Uh, new primitives for visualizing our, our models, or behaviors. This is sort of the old thing, artifacts, relations, uh, maybe a little bit of behavior expressed in, in method names. Uh, but now we have this very tactile visualization. We have, we have a timeline, we have uh, knowledge graphs, basically. We have constraints or business rules. We have commands which are intentions. So it's uh, intention revealing. Uh, we have a history of events. We have branching. Right? This is almost like programming with post-its. Um, and we're doing it with the domain experts who believe that they cannot, uh, that, that they don't like code. You know, they, they don't like technical stuff. Uh, but here we're teaching them how to program without even them knowing that they're programming. So it's very, it's very and it's just so elegant because you can, you can just move it around. It's so inviting to take, like somebody comes and sees all these Post-its on the wall is reading them and say, yeah, wait a minute, but we don't do it this way. We actually do it this way. Try doing that with the Visio diagram in, in that you have spent three weeks modeling uh, uh, on a 15-inch screen and then somebody comes and says, yeah, this is, this is wrong. Uh, then you have to spend another day to fix it. It's, it's very slow. This is very fast. You can do this in half a day or a day. And if you do this event storming, if you do this thing with all the post-its, you could actually add even more information to that. Actors or roles or who is doing this um, queries, which is uh, when you ask the system for its state, right? Um, uh, you could, well, not going to go into detail, but you could uh, mark on this model which uh, business rules or constraints need to be immediately consistent or which are allowed to have um, eventual consistency which becomes very interesting and important in sort of distributed systems, in more complex systems. Um, we can start modeling aggregates, which if you have some experience with event sourcing, um, this should sh sort of show that our aggregates are not about entities anymore. Our aggregates are about modeling a process, a logical process, as one, one uh, consistent thing. That's what an aggregate is supposed to be in event sourcing. Um, so I just sh should mention at this point that this view of our system where everything is events over time and commands and intentions and business rules, that's just one view, the dynamic view. But the static view, the structural model is still valuable. Don't just throw that away. Um, but this is, this is my first, uh, I, I start a project always with event storming because it's the, the fastest way I know of to extract a lot of information from a domain expert. Um, so. I'm still trying to show you how powerful this is because right now it still probably looks simple. So again, I simplified this because I, I got rid of all the business rules and commands that would be in between these events now uh, because I want to show sort of bigger patterns now that we can see uh, when we start doing this. For example, so we know that um, an artifact is, can be described as instead of state as all the events leading up to the state, all the state changes. Right, the same way Git works really, where uh, Git doesn't store your code, it stores all the changes to your code. This is the same model, so it's nothing new. Uh, but what we see is that there's a, there's a pattern that is coming back all the time, uh, where you have some process with some beginning and some end, and there might be some more branching in there, but I, I left it uh, for simplicity. Um, so there is some process where different people are working on something, um, and some artifact is the result of that. And then this artifact is used to do something else. Um, the names we have for this is collaborative construction or maybe planning. So it's typically something you do together. We have an artifact and then you have the execution. And this is everywhere. Well, I already mentioned Git. This is actually a good example because you are, Git commits are events. You are working on this together. You create an artifact, which is your code base. You deploy it, and then some e literal execution starts where this code is being executed, right? Um, but we have this in everywhere. Um, well, so this maps to the three Bs uh, to some degree. Um, we have with invoices, for example. It could be that different people are building up this invoice over time. Maybe the salesperson is adding some, some products, and maybe the account manager is adding some customer details. 
um, maybe somebody else from inventory is adding prices and then the CFO signs off on it and now this this invoice is done it's sent to client it becomes immutable now because when you send an invoice to somebody you cannot change it anymore so this invoice document is the artifact and this artifact actually prescribes what this execution process is going to be like this artifact this this you can imagine the paper document is, is saying I expect you to pay me this amount of money within this time period etc so it's describing what should happen after uh, the customer receives the invoice um, and we have this everywhere. This is an example from um, uh, warehouse management um, where there's some process of building up an order and then you send the order and then, uh, again, I greatly simplified it. Uh, the truck comes to your warehouse um, and unloads all the goods and somebody with, uh, they, call, uh, they call them the receiving operator, is a person who has to stand at the dock. They get a paper uh, with that lists everything that is supposed to be in the truck. And while the truck is being unloaded, they are just checking it off, okay, 10 of those and five of those. And it says 10 here, but you only brought five, so you know we need to resolve this. Or it says five here and you brought 10, and then they need to make a decision. Are we going to keep the extra products that we didn't order, or are we going to send them back? Or maybe some of them are damaged and we need to decide to put them uh, um, to give them back to the to the truck driver or maybe to put them somewhere separately and sell them to another party you have these like supermarket chains that sell slightly damaged goods at lower prices uh, so this process of this is called a receiving process and then you have the put away process which means putting all the goods in the or all the stock in the right uh, places in the in the warehouse um, we have this in insurance there's a this collaborative construction phase is a negotiation where different parties are over time agreeing to the details of the contract. Of course, if this is just a, a private customer, then typically it's just, you know, sign here. Uh, uh, it's like a pre-made uh, contract. But for complex insurance contracts, th this is a process that where you build the invoice over the contract over time, and then maybe years later, this customer will file a claim, a damage claim, um, and the insurance contract again prescribes how this process is going to go. Um, there's a third phase. I'm not going to go into detail as well, but we can we can track this. This is because we have the history of everything. It becomes actually extremely easy. This is an audit log. You know, this is we can we can look at everything that has happened typically in the execution process, get learn information from that, get use statistics and feed this back into improving our collaborative construction process. Uh, this happens also everywhere. A again, you guys are doing this. If you deploy your system and you run it, and then you look at logs and um, uh, error logs and whatever uh, to see how this system behaves over time, and this helps you improve the system. Uh, and it's everywhere, especially things like warehouse management. If you get, you know, they need to be able to track everything. Uh, who moved this food from the truck to the freezer and who moved it from the freezer to the next truck and uh, all this stuff is now just encapsulated in this history of events that we store uh, using event sourcing. Um, so we call this the, the, the three archetypes uh, basically. Um, okay, we have a little bit more time. Um, this is this is actually could be more complex, more involved. Uh, I've worked for a uh, debt collection um, uh, company. They did. They built software for for uh, debt collection, credit control, and it allowed um, the customers uh, who use their system to determine how invoicing, how this process of invoicing happens. So, in a simple environment, if you have a small company, company, this might be some implicit internal policy where we're saying that um, if somebody is not paying on time we will uh, first send them an email then we will call them on the phone and then we will send a lawyer in three weeks that's like an internal policy uh, or the policy might be more ex more complex where we're saying yeah but if it's a very good paying customer uh, who regularly has um, invoices of more than I don't know a million euros um, then we are actually going to be a lot more gentle. We're going to wait four more weeks before we start calling them, right? This could all be just, you know, uh, agreed upon in the heads of the, of the users. But it could also be in the system, as a coded in the system. So the system is telling us how to 
go through this invoicing process and how to go through this process of, of uh, getting our money, you know, being aggressive or being not aggressive. Um, so this could be just some business rules that are coded explicitly, or it could even be um, uh, if, we, if we are building this system for maybe uh, uh, different cu customers, and they all have their own rules about how to approach their customers, and especially their customers who are not paying. Um, there could be, this policy could evolve, right? This could be its own collaborative construction process where different people are maybe changing the rules about how we are dealing with non-paying customers. So I said before that the artifact is prescribing the execution process, uh, but in fact there could be also internal policies prescribing the execution process. Uh, so then we need to start wondering what happens if the policy changes while a process is ongoing. You know, invoicing could take weeks or months before we get our money. If during this period we decide that uh, from now on we want to be more aggressive uh, and start calling every two days, for example, um, then how does this affect the existing processes that are running? Remember the, the uh, teachers and the students that I was telling you about earlier? They had no visual model like this. What they should have done is modeled it like this, and then they would see, you know, what happens if here somebody re or, or here somebody removes a module that you actually had some uh, scored some points on or, or scored some grades on, right? Th this this makes it very visible, not just to you, but to again, you can play around with this with domain experts. You can take these post-its and say, okay, but what if this one happens before that one, or what if it happens after that one? What if somebody uh, uh, crazy ideas? What if somebody pays? an invoice before we send the invoice. Is that possible? Well, we have to ask the domain expert, but it could be that people are um, you know, paying monthly and maybe we are late uh, with sending the invoice, so we get a payment and we have no way of telling which invoice this payment belongs to because we don't have the invoice yet. With this, we can very easily model these race conditions with non-technical technical people. Um, same here, what if the policies change? Uh, uh, what if, um, well, this is maybe not the best example because it, with uh, unloading a truck, it takes maybe half an hour. If the policy changes while we are unloading the truck, if from now on we're saying damaged goods, instead of uh, giving them to the back to the truck driver, we take them. If this policy changes within this half hour, probably it wouldn't affect anything. But at least we can visualize it and, and discuss it now. Where it does become really important is very long-running processes, right? Insurance, uh, I, uh, uh, my client was a life insurance company. They have contracts that last decades, right? So this process that we're visualizing here is a process that in, that in fact might take, might take years. So um, they, and they have different, they have the product change. So they have um, today, a product for them is, is an insurance contract, basically, and they might change their product, they might come up with new rules. Um, how does this affect the existing customers, right? The, the existing insured uh, customers? And they might change internal policies. For example, uh, one thing we were dealing with was changing the way uh, they, they deal with fraud and trying to detect fraud. You know, if an insurance company is facing fraud very often, uh, they will change their internal policies to try to prevent it and try to deal with it and detect it, etc. So what happens if you're in the middle of a damage claim, which could be a long process where uh, we need to send experts, etc. This, this might take a while. What if during this process um, we, s we start changing the rules? How does it affect things? We can visualize it now and, and discuss it. I don't think this, this thing is possible with sort of traditional uh, entity relationship diagrams. Um, I have, for the people who, I, I know this is maybe get, uh, quite a lot and hard to see for people who have no experience with uh, event sourcing at all, to see how you would build a system like this in practice. So one thing I would say first is that even if you build a very traditional model, uh, not event sourced, uh, just with relational database or with the document database, with doctrine, whatever, even though uh, in that case your code would not really match this kind of uh, temporal model, it's still valuable to make the temporal model because you will still um, detect things, discover things about how the system behaves that you wouldn't have thought of uh, that you can discuss with, with domain experts. Um, 
But for the people who do build event source systems, um, I have some quick um, suggestions of how you can implement this. For example, uh, well, this would be like the, the, the rule of thumb that if you have something that you see as a process um, with branches and et cetera, with, with logical, with business rules, with invariance, with constraints that sort of belong together logically, that could be an aggregate. So instead of focusing your aggregate on modeling things in your domain, we're now focusing it on modeling processes in the domain. Um, and if we have rules that don't need to Im uh, enforce, no, don't need to be enforced straight away, uh, these events could go to uh, process managers, which manage sort of longer or more complex processes over time uh, across multiple aggregates. Um, but don't worry if this is not making a lot of sense. Um, same here if you're doing event sourcing, if you have some experience with existing uh, design patterns like um, strategies, etc. So we could, for example, so basically what I'm trying to show here is that if we have a process where policies change uh, over time, where today we are taking back damaged goods and tomorrow we're sending back damaged goods, for example, if this changes this policy, we could store the version number of the policy inside the event. So now this entire process here knows, all the business rules knows, know that they have to use version two to make decisions, version two of the policy or version three of the policy. So the event, the, the, the process, the events actually store information of the context that was the reality when they happened, if that makes sense. Um, different patterns would be to uh, not just have a version number, but in fact copy the whole specification or the whole business rule into the first event, and then the subsequent decisions are using the information already stored in the event to make the decisions. Um, yeah, I'm not going to go into too much detail. Uh, even with strategies, you can do the strategy objects. Um, uh, you could decide that um, this is an example where the process is in fact affected by policy changes while they happen. So it's not just whatever the policy was when the process started, but whatever the policy is when something new happens in this in this process. But you know, just uh, just showing it for people who uh, who are interested. Um, what I'm just so this is back to my point at the beginning. When you have complex business process, I think you really need a temporal model. I think you need a way of expressing things happening over time, the effects of one process on another process, um, uh, events, constraints, uh, intentions, commands, uh, branching, this kind of stuff. And of course, if you talk about time and temporal models, you have to talk about uh, Einstein a little bit. This is a quote I really like. The only reason for time is so that everything doesn't happen at once. Right. This is, if you show a UML diagram with just things, it, everything is on there at once. You don't see the progress over time. So if time matters in your system, uh, model time. Thank you for listening. Uh, this is me. If you have any questions, uh, I think we're out of time, but uh, just come see me. I'm here. Thanks. <laughs>